So I want to, uh, just before we get started with the dialogue, I just want to uh, start out uh, saying I think we can all agree on one thing, which is that um, humor in art is like a frog in a puddle. Right? I mean, that's obvious, I think. So we see the frog in the puddle. Frog seems to be having a good time, splashing around, um, enjoying itself. We're curious about that, curious about <clears throat> its liveliness, where it gets its sense of fun. So we grab the frog. And then we hold on to the frog for a little while. It's not in the puddle anymore. It doesn't seem to be having as good a time. Hard to tell how it gets, has its fun. Turn it over. Maybe think about, wonder what's going on inside there. Cut it open. It's definitely not having a very good time. But I can see how the heart works. I can see how it's going on. Pretty soon, that frog is definitely not in the puddle or having a good time anymore. It's dead. So let's kill a frog. <laughs> All right. Okay, what, am I supposed to respond to that? No. no okay. <laughs> so I, I, I wanted to start, uh, we have the great uh, honor and luxury to have Carl here with us to talk to us about a bunch of the things that we've been specula speculating on in a variety of ways this morning. And I thought maybe we could just start out by talking a little bit about your um, early, your background, because uh, I want to talk to you about your use of humor and uh, the way that you think about humor. And um, so I know you grew up in a German family, mm -hmm. and a German friend of mine once told me that when Germans try to be funny, it always ends in disaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I wonder yeah. if you grew up in a, in a household in a context that valued humor. Uh, I don't know particularly uh, uh, necessarily that, but I was always uh, interested in kind of performing in a sense, and so my early childhood was based on having some exposure to the Marshall Fields, uh, had a, a toy department that, uh, within that toy department, they had a uh, little theater that had uh, puppet performances. There was a character named Clippo the Clown that was went through various different uh, uh, narratives, and uh, then there was also usually a uh, kind of some sort of fairy tale presentation in puppetry, uh, marionettes actually. And uh, th that was a location that mothers mainly at that time would deposit their children while they went out shopping, you know, within the rest of the Marshall Field store. And so uh, that was a, uh, my mother actually made her own clothes, so she didn't do too much shopping at Marshall Fields, but for some reason or another, maybe she bought pots and pans or something, I'm not sure, but I was deposited in that location uh, when she went to Marshall Fields, which was fairly, what seems like frequently now in my mind, but uh, uh, so that really impressed me, this kind of theater element there. And then there was, uh, when I was growing up, which was a long, long time ago, uh, there was a lot of radio, which I listened to, the, the humorous Jack Benny, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that was very influential to me as well. And then later, via the, like Mike Nichols and Lane May, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, more audio uh, kind of version of humor versus, uh, you know, some of the films of the Marx Brothers, et cetera. So that was kind of some of the components that uh, kind of influenced me beyond my, uh, you know, my parents who were not necessarily funny as such, but they were very involved in art. My father was a terrific artist, uh, but he was, uh, worked as a, a machinist actually, and so he didn't, but he did uh, on the weekends would do art, and a lot of times I remember going to the, uh, the zoo the uh, Lincoln Park Zoo, and we would uh, do drawings of animals, and uh, when we went on vacations, uh, we would be out doing landscape paintings. So uh, there was that, and as I mentioned, my mother was a uh, seamstress, and she earned some extra uh, income via her work as you know, selling suits, et cetera, et cetera, for uh, individual clientele. Maybe I'll just, yeah. leave, okay. I'll leave that with you. All right, I'll, sure. I'll try to project. Okay. Um, when, were you, 
were you a class clown type of person? Yeah, I, I had that aspect too as I got more into uh, grade school, high school, right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's interesting because yeah. there's an early film of you. Uh, I mean, it's not when you were a kid, but no. it's a little bit later, and you're mugging a lot, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of humor in it that mm -hmm. goes beyond the um, beyond the the work. It's mm -hmm. uh, your presentation is yeah. very theatrical, and mm -hmm. you can see yeah. it's interesting to know that those things were all there. Yeah. Did you did you ever see Second City or Compass Rose? Uh, Only yeah. later, you know, not after I already you know been formed, so to speak. So yeah. I, I only saw one, actually, one production. I think, uh, I think it had to do with Red Grooms being in town. I can't recall, but we, we saw one. I can't, checking with Lori. Yeah, I don't know what the occasion was, but it was quite, you know, not too, you know, it was way, way removed from any influence, yeah. And, and you mentioned radio and... and radio uh, was the prime you know, influence there. And, you know, some of these films, like the Marx Brothers particularly, they're kind of very, uh, you know, arc anarchic kind of humor, you know, kind of throw everything out the window, so to speak. Uh, uh, what about comics? When did that become something that uh, Well, you it was with? not so much comics, but the newspapers. I, uh, people that have heard me talk on the subject uh, may know just in terms of my getting connected very early on uh, with the comic strip, the daily comic strip, and uh, particularly uh, uh, Dick Tracy, uh, and then also Little Abner. They were in different newspapers, but uh, I was able to get via the, our next door neighbor was a railroad man, and he would bring the papers from the train. He was an engineer, and uh, uh, the train would ha frequently have these newspapers that people left, and he would bring them back, and I would get to see these other papers with all the different comics. Uh, so I got to see the range of, uh, I think we had about three or four, Herald Tribune, and not the Tribune, but the Herald and Herald American. Herald American, that's it, right, right. So we had several newspapers, Sun-Times, Tribune, uh, Daily, News. Daily News, but that came later. I don't, I, that, I don't think that was in the offing when I was a little kid. So I just remember those three. So the funnies. Yeah, right. And then later with uh, Batman was a particular, uh, that was uh, attractive to me. Just similar to uh, Chester Gould's uh, Dick Tracy, the, the kind of strange uh, criminals, that both of those uh, law-abiding crime fighters uh, <laughs> engaged in. You know, the Joker, et cetera, Penguin with Batman. So um, we're, we're really talking about uh, um, uh, Chicago in the mid 20th century, and, and mm -hmm. one of the things that we, we nobody, I don't think we've really talked about is the way that humor and art are both very context dependent, or at least in some ways can be considered context dependent. I think humor, especially, is so dependent on a context. It's very mm -hmm. hard from to translate a joke from one mm -hmm. community to another. It's why, mm -hmm. like, poles don't consider. Polish Polak jokes, jokes very, funny. very yeah. funny, and right. uh, and vice versa. And there mm. are all sorts of jokes that just mm. lie flat unless mm. they're animated by the context. Right. Uh, it's something that I think, in some ways, um, art has in common with uh, mm -hmm. with that. So I'm thinking a little bit about the context of here in Chicago in that period, and the emergence of what we've been talking about all day, um, the the Harry Who. So I want to ask a little bit about um, the pre. Harry, who uh, uh, Carl Worsham mm -hmm. uh, artwork mm -hmm. in relation to humor, because um, the work, for instance, uh, one of the really great paintings um, in the Aronson collection mm -hmm. is the wonderful painting of the, the called armpits. armpits. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, it's a very humorous painting, mm -hmm. um, but it's also a formally very. Um, uh, I think daring painting. I think it's it, the, what's going on formally in it is really also part of what's going on. So I want to ask you sort of a little bit. This is before you would have met any of the other people right, right. Mm -hmm. in the in the Harry Who. Um, how yeah. do, how do you see your work in that period? <clears throat> well, as you referenced uh, the armpit painting, which uh, had a woman kind of symmetrically presented uh, frontally, and her arms were raised. One of these glamour poses. Uh, her arms are 
in her hair and that exposed her armpits. And the armpits, I brought, uh, I think, some uh, little uh, pelt or something from the uh, secondhand store and ripped some of the fur off that and then placed it strategically in the armpit. And so, and it had, uh, I think, a very simple, uh, almost comic book uh, red and yellow kind of color palette, and then that it was kind of an explosion in which the, the figure was ensconced in. And actually, uh, what I thought was the best element was this interactive situation. It was in, at IIT, a uh, uh, group show, and it was in this show where students at IIT were you know, in, with it. And so one of the students had gotten this uh, antiperspirant band and put it on top of the painting, which I thought was, that was, that was it. And so uh, I was glad to be a participant in that so-called show there, visual show. The um, work from that period that, uh, that I've seen in the um, wonderful retrospective uh, at the Cultural Center mm -hmm. some years ago and in various other collections and reproduction <clears throat> seems to have uh, maybe a slightly more direct relationship to surrealism. Um, and it seems yeah. like, I mean, it's younger work. It's right. work where you're forming right. what you're mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. But it draws out, I mean, people talk about the surrealist aspect of Chicago art quite mm -hmm. often, and that um, feels like it's very prominent there in terms mm -hmm. of things like juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. um, you very often used multiple, like two images. Oh, yeah, two double images. portraits, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, and things like that. And they evoke either the uncanny or the, or the sense of strangeness. Mm -hmm. um, what, what artists were you looking at and thinking about while you were, when you, when you were in that period? Uh, well, uh, not to directly answer your question, but the double p uh, portrait ones d uh, related to uh, the double mint twins. Uh, it was kind of airbrushed uh, uh, imagery that had uh, two women, very stylized airbrush situation. And they generally were presented in, on uh, buses or L's that had the, in, in the area that you put these little cardboard things with images of, of things to buy. And they were generally like skiing twins or playing tennis, etc. But the ones that I used for the, for the portraits were these kind of anonymous uh, newspaper uh, images. They, they were done more realistically, more uh, connected to the photographic image, this kind of stylized situation there uh, that might be in this kind of cheap reproduction in the uh, newspaper of uh, maybe uh, someone that had been killed, you know, something that was connected uh, and they just had some kind of bad it w uh, reproduction that came off uh, a high school yearbook or something of that nature. And so I did about three of those and uh, uh, had three versions of that. And that, the kind of, the, and they were all women, just like the uh, double mint twin ads. And, but it had this more sinister aspect just in terms of even though the image themselves had this ghoulish component because they were usually uh, some women that had been killed or were missing or something of that nature. And it was not so much what, why they appeared, but sometimes actually they were wedding photos uh, that were presented. But it was just the kind of strangeness of the face, the, the particular physical nature of the face that attracted me. And uh, so in terms of what artists I was looking at, uh, one artist uh, that was particularly of influence to me was, uh, I had a friend, uh, Errol Ortiz, who uh, uh, his father was a janitor and he was also an artist. And uh, this was, uh, and they lived on uh, North Avenue and I uh, kind of above the near the old town ale house. And uh, I uh, lived in that area as well, uh, not too many blocks away from there. But anyway, it doesn't matter where I was living. But uh, <laughs> the, the significant factor of this is his, his father was a good friend of Cliff Westerman when he was in Chicago. And they were both uh, acrobatic uh, 
participants, and so they would do a lot of these. As people who know of Cliff Westerman, he was uh, very athletic and uh, was able to do some of these uh, kind of circus-type uh, tumbling tricks. And uh, so uh, Errol Ortiz's father uh, was also in that mindset, and they were good friends. And and uh, Westerman did a uh, uh, a, cam a little canvas piece that was a portrait of uh, Errol Ortiz's father, and that was quite an influence because I I saw that this was uh, the type of things that I well as a kid actually I wanted when I went to the art institute which I attended to, at does my school years uh, after high school. Uh, I wanted to be a comic artist, uh, you know, in the EC tradition, and uh, uh, and that was my goal, going to you know to further that goal. And so when I saw the H.C. Westerman, it uh, encouraged me to you know bring this kind of sensibility into the into the format of a more fine art context, because I was familiar with his sculptural pieces that I had seen at the Frumpkin Gallery, and. Uh, and that this presented another kind of option there. That's amazing. So, so, and one other thing, actually, oh, yeah. just in regard to that, the graphic component that Japan. When I was going to the institute before I saw the Westerman, the Japanese prints and the the, the Asian way of treating painting also was a, a, a direction I could see it myself going into, where it wasn't the same uh, kind of approach as Western art in terms of painting. Were, were there any teachers at the school, the Art Institute, when you were there, who you felt had any um, uh, sensitivity to humor? Uh, well, uh, I'm not. I'm going to divert a little bit from it again. <laughs> uh, not, not really. But uh, there were a few teachers that did influence me greatly. Was Kathleen Blackshire, particularly, uh, and she was a history of art teacher, and particularly uh, uh, the fact of. Uh, getting off the focus of Western art again, where there was the African art, the Asian art, et cetera, et cetera, these other cultures, these other time periods, uh, Egyptian art, et cetera, that was uh, influential to me. And so it, it, uh, <laughs> it wasn't so much humor, but more in a general way. I think I was just naturally, uh, you know, as I said, as a kid, I was more the class clown, et cetera, et cetera. So I was more naturally inclined to that anyway, and uh, in, in some regards that would sneak in no matter pretty much, well, it, well, it, didn't, it doesn't encompass everything I do, but it's, it's a part there. Well, I, I wanted to uh, maybe now bridge into talking about the, let's say, work from, the, from 1966 onward as you, you become associated with this group, the Harry Who, mm -hmm. you are shown at the Hyde Park Art Center as mm -hmm. part of the exhibition groups that show there in 66, mm -hmm. 67, and 69, and mm -hmm. or 8. Yeah. And um, so maybe before we talk sure. more about that, sure. we can run through some images. I have uh, just a group of drawings sure. here, um, maybe 10 or so drawings. Okay. This is actually, I, I'm now realizing, having looked at it several times this morning, uh, drawing related to click, right. the, the painting right. at, uh -huh. at the um, at Elmhurst. Yeah. Um, so maybe I could talk about this. No, we can just go through okay. some of All these, right. and, sure. and uh, if there's one in particular that uh, well, this one might be good just in terms of that idea of I don't know if this is humor either, but it uh, it has to do with windshield wipers, and it's not on. I mean, this is a drawing. But it's a drawing for the an ultimate uh, piece that was done on plexiglass, and uh, so the the windshield wiper is that uh, instrument that's moving across the mouth there, and uh, in the painting uh, there's uh, the painting is done in the uh, quality of comic imagery I suppose where you have the outlining and the the shapes there the strong black shapes. Uh, that are contoured, and there's no real pigmentation uh, diversity involved there, and it's on the back of the plexiglass, and it's so the, you get that illuminated quality of, uh, or reflective, or the, uh, the emulsion, or whatever, the, it, rather than using a glaze, 
there's the aspect of the glass provides the glazing component there. And so the, that S, the kind of rec, the, the curving arc component there is wiped away, the, the paint is, is like smeared as if the white windshield wiper was moving the paint and uh, obliterating that hard edge uh, stylization of the paint. I don't know if I made myself clear what was happening there, and it's difficult to translate that maybe since it's a drawing, not a painting. But the, the, the movement part that you see in that kind of arc is going to be paint that is smeared uh, and not, that is into the face, mouth situation. And it would actually be smeared. So yeah, then right. in that case, it would be stylistically quite different from the rest correct, of the painting. Correct, correct, right. Mm -hmm. I want to mention, too, because I want to ask you about text a little bit later, but just yeah. that the, you, you seem often in the drawings, even now, to have sort of no. several possible titles yeah. uh, that might be articulated. So this one says, Rearview Park and uh, Wipe Your Ass. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there was Riverview <laughs> Park, and I think that was the reference to that, and Rearview Park. Uh, uh, of course, brings your attention to the rear, and then the wipe your ass uh, <coughs> would relate to the rear in some way. And, and, the, and the wiper. And the wiper, right, right, right. All right. That's, I don't remember what the title eventually was. Probably wasn't wipe that. Out. Wipe out, that was it. Wipe out, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pen, okay. Pencil drawing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this here, oh, I have that one, the, the eye tooth, but uh, cutting your eye tooth or something. Yeah, that, but that's coming might, up. Yeah, I know. But this might be mud in your, I don't know what, I don't have any uh, associations with that, it looks like. <laughs> it says bottom down here. You seem to have a oh. sort of interest in <laughs> the rear. Right, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> man. That, whoa, I Sorry. don't generally have that. <laughs> Kind of humor, so to speak, but <laughs> seems to be showing up here. But uh, so I have, I, I see some lemon shapes there in the back of the head, but uh, I'm not, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any associations with this. You don't have to. But I talk should. about all of them. I kind of like this one. <laughs> okay, this was uh, part of a, a detail for uh, you know a sketch that would eventually be a. Uh, uh, a one person show at the another uh, Catholic institution was what Saint, Xavier, Saint Xavier. Saint Xavier, right? Thank you. And there's the X on the crate there for for the. Uh, uh, I just have the A V I E R, and then the X has that crate. It's a on a crate. It's uh, that little dog is uh, is uh, like the Maxwell, not Maxwell Street, but the. Uh, RCA? No, no, no. The uh, uh, where the soapbox uh, outside the uh, what? Yeah, right. Bug House Square, correct. Where people would get up on a soapbox and deliver, you know, some diatribe, little political diatribe or some other philosophical message to the crowd. And so this this little dog here was going to be delivering a message of announcing the dates of the show, etc. And uh, I ultimately had a, uh, a kind of contortionist woman that was uh, presented differently than, than right now, but it was like between two legs that this is going on. Uh, I don't remember the exact uh, total piece, but the, the, the piece was more dominated by this contortionist uh, woman. And this, uh, this is probably, when I, did I say bottom on this one or not? No, no that was the other one. <laughs> But this is the bottom of the, of the ultimate uh, poster, but just a fragment of it. All right. Yeah. OK. And this is, this is just a little bit of uh, <laughs> a little tapping, another connection to dance in a way. It's kind of doing uh, some kind of jitterbug thing here. With These this. are from 69, from 70, 70. Yeah, 70. Now. There's a this date one's there. From 70. Yeah. And, one of the things uh, I think it really interested me was the coat, you know, just kind of 
there was a kind of coat that used to be worn that had these kind of tufts of little fibers that would stick out. And uh, I don't know what, was it, it wasn't camel hair, wasn't that a lot more? There was these little projections, like uh, like a five o'clock shadow or 12 o'clock shadow. Yeah, they just got little sprouts. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> little sprouts that came off. Uh, we have some textile people here, but uh, it's not ringing a doorbell. But I think <laughs> what, What's going on with these two? Uh, oh, those are breasts. Those are side views of breasts, stylized breasts. Ah. <laughs> See the nipple part? Got it. And, yep. Mm, got it. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is similar. I mean, it's it's a uh, more three quarters, not very. I mean, it's a different kind of stylization as that armpit painting, but it has that that same positioning, but more on a three, looking at a three quarters and and not extreme stylization of it. I mean, it it is extreme on some levels, but it's a different different uh, focus of stylization. But the, I love the, this is a good example of one of the things that you do a lot, especially in this period, is that uh, way of using the contour line element so that it goes beyond uh, volume and it starts to become a mask. So it's sort mm -hmm. of telling you something about the volume of the face, about how, yeah, right. but it's also becoming sort of like a decorative element on the face as well. Right, or are the arms. I well, think. on the arms too, yeah. yeah. And it, uh, I, I, I've always loved the way that you handle that, the, mm -hmm. all of the that, and sometimes it gets filled in and sometimes mm -hmm. it gets left open. Right. Well, particularly in the drawings, it would be just more linear and then I could fill in. But I can see here would be maybe were, I don't think they were done at the same time, uh, same time period. I mean, they may have been done at the same time period, but that previous one that had the side view, the, the breast, that could have been like in the torso area, there's, no, there's just a linear outline. But they're, they w could have been, it's, the breasts would be in more of a side view position. And so uh, that could have been some notation on something like this where it, where it needs uh, a focus on the interior of the body. And uh, it was uh, represented in this other page of the sketchbook. You don't have to talk about all of them. We can look. Okay, sure. Well, this is the one that was the Playboy, I think, uh, Lynn Warren. I did see the presentation of Lynn Warren on my, one of my students' uh, laptop uh, streaming. And so I think she referenced this as a Playboy. It was a, a drawing, a sketch for a, the final, uh, was illustrating some uh, story that had to do with cowboys and, I don't, you know, the Western phenomena. So I had uh, several figures on either side of a, a cowboy in the center, and one of those more symmetrical presentations. Okay. And uh, this was from a photo. I can't remember the exact. Uh, uh, it might have been. I know this is referencing some sort of Hollywood starlet, and I can't. I mean, it looks more like. I, I think it may have referenced. Uh, Share or something. I'm not sure, uh, because it was uh, it was something I can't remember. I'm a little foggy on that. Wait, the first official portrait of uh, and it's obliterated. Uh. Okay, <laughs> so okay, so this is uh, a little bit of a bird uh, component there, some of these feathers, feather, feather uh, skirt uh, revealing, uh, looks like another one of those kind of weird uh, panties that have that, it's a little different, maybe a stitchery kind of thing there for the uh, decorative component of the panties. I was also, actually just this would work too, the, uh, the way of uh, the arms being constructed in a certain way that would align itself to uh, to insects and that kind of multiple uh, segmentation there and that kind of reflective component of the flesh, which just like that that kind of comic uh, iconic style of usually that that is 
appearing throughout, usually is, appears in uh, the hair or some uh, garment that is like leather or something that has a reflective component, and generally not included in the flesh aspect. But I was thinking more, not so much of flesh, but the, the scaly outer skeletal crustacean of the insect, and that would have a reflective situation. I see here there is the literal ha 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 hair some hair something a ranger right? hair arranger uh -huh. hair arranger yeah right H -A -H -A. I, yeah. yeah ha 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 ha, ha. arranger okay whoa uh, it's interesting yeah. thinking about like uh, then the insect analog as mm -hmm. a also one like one way of generating these images and yeah. then this other thing that's interesting about this and about a number of them is the plasticity of the figure. I mean, it's something, I, I talked to Peter Saul a little bit uh -huh. about um, kind of, and he was a major concern for him, is sort of how far you could push the body before it would break up, break before it, it, yeah. would, it would not yeah. seem a body anymore. Right, right. And that seems to be really a part of what's going on in a lot of these, mm -hmm. um, just pushing it as far as possible, and you have those uh, articulated women as well, where they, they actually they, move they around. Move, right. That was kind of connected up to the Halloween skeleton uh, cardboard, little cardboard cutouts that you get at five and ten store, and they have the the grommets or not grommets, but some kind of element that allows the the legs and the arms to kind of move around, right, to be manipulated. Yeah. And that would be right, the same thing. Right. Uh, that was the other side of the. Playboy. The Playboy, right. And uh, right. So that was on the right side, the other was on the left side, and there was this, I believe it was a cowboy in the middle, but I can't remember. And this, I think, was the, uh, was the leg, the leg uh, of that previous figure. Nazi helmet skirt. Yeah, so that skirt has that, that same kind of outline. The, uh, the silhouette of a helmet, uh, Nazi helmet, that they had a kind of more unique, uh, you know, it was a different kind of helmet than the, the uh, Allied forces had. Uh, right. Yeah, so that we're, it was just that shape, the shape of the, the outer shape of it. Were you looking at, at were you aware of um, sort of uh, fetish drawings at that time or like Tom of Finland or any mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff, since this has that same sort of Leather boots. Yeah, with the uh, boots and things. Uh, not really, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, that kind of thing appeared not necessarily uh, limited to certain fetish elements, but it, you know, appeared in comic books and things. You know, right. The, the, or the, it says it was for Playboy, they had some of that more softer pornography involved in their magazine. This is the eye teeth, cutting one's eye teeth. So this one makes, it, it makes me want to ask you about vicious humor mm -hmm. a little bit, since mm -hmm. it's such a, it's sort of a really nasty mm -hmm. um, image. Yeah. Um, and kind of how that plays with the more, the gentler side of, yeah. of your, your work. Right. Well, um, I, I don't think of, I mean, it may be interpreted that, I don't think of it as, na but the idea of en engaging in uh, humor to m modify, uh, you know, a, a very troubling circumstance, kind of using humor as a way of, you know, like this is disaster, you know, or, uh, and if you can kind of kind of cut that, the edge of it off somewhat with humor, uh, as I, in terms of my own life, when I've enc encountered some very difficult situations that that's what I employ to kind of uh, bring another perspective so I'm not totally in uh, immersed in depression or some sort of uh, very angsty kind of quality of life. Mm. Okay this is kind of based on more butterfly motif and uh, I think Dubuffet did some work of actually using butterfly wings to create uh, you know, some figurative component, and I kind of did that with rather than ripping butterfly wings apart, uh, just did a drawing component. <laughs> That's very uh, humane of you. Yeah, right. 
or, or <laughs> butterfly, I kind of can't come up with anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this again is one of the insect uh, components in that same stylization there. Jim, is the next one? Uh, and this actually, one other thing. The one other thing has uh, that little uh, uh, cloud-like component, which I consider a cloud above the head. It's, you were just talking about dark humor. I, it, this relates to little Abner, uh, where he had this one character that would uh, always have the cloud under his, over his head with rain coming down. And so that's a little bit of a note, you know, the dark cloud above the head. And this is that same hairdo that yeah, you, you had at the time, right? right and Lori, Lori right. Mm -hmm. So this is for her meeting up with me, I guess. <laughs> Whoa, dark cloud. Oh, oh yeah. This is for a, another uh, drawing for a, uh, a show. Uh, and I, can't, I guess it was a show that we had in New York, I believe, I think. California, okay, yeah. And so it was famous artists, obviously, that fun has been used before. Artists. And, uh, <laughs> and from Chicago, from, you see the from, and then in the ultimate portrait, it would be, or the ultimate uh, poster, it would be, Chicago would be noted somewhere. And this was a, uh, a fiber piece that uh, it was to reproduce the the final poster uh, that they employed some sort of uh, uh, element that would stray. They had a, a, an adhesive that was implied, like just say, use the the heart as an example of a dark area, and would be implied, or any of the areas that were dark would have this like fuzzy felt kind of aspect attached to it because there was some kind of a, a blowgun they had that they. Like a flocking? Though? Yeah, flocking, there's the term, right, very good. Yeah. If you could say how you'd characterize the imagist sense of humor, or whether it has a special sensibility, um, whether it's ironic or sarcastic, mm -hmm. or, and, and also whether you see it as being quintessentially Midwestern. Uh, <clears throat> I generally shy away from those, you know, where I have to kind of categorize or uh, bring, uh, a certain kind of uh, <laughs> thing to it. So I, I think I'll have to pass on that one because I, I think each of the individual Harry Who people uh, kind of, a, even though they're lumped together, have their own various ways of approaching that. And it probably isn't so directly just like myself. I don't think it's one necessarily, it may be a byproduct of the end goal, but I don't think it's necessarily set up as a, um, uh, you know, the ultimate outcome of a particular piece would not be necessarily wanting to have a joke. Right. I mean, I might be closest to that where occasionally I will have something that will be just like a one-liner kind of thing, and that's the premise of the piece. But uh, I think for the others, they're more nuanced and have other attributes. And I mean, I, I would think maybe one of the aspects, again, in terms of the uh, just a specific piece that it is associated with myself would be I did a piece called Christ Kite, which was black and white, and uh, the main premise of the whole thing had to do with the the more dime store kites that one would get rather than some of the more elaborate constructions, and so that would be uh, a kind of diamond shape, a skewed diamond shape that would have the cross would be paper wrapped around some crossbars that you would flip, and then you would get this uh, cross, and then the paper would be on the outside, and the cross part, the cross of the wood, would be, uh, wouldn't be viewable. So I got one of these from the dime store and just painted the, the paper and put a stylized Christ on the front of the, uh, the, paper, the, the kite the paper, and then on the back was alluded to the cross. And, and it was also the, like the uh, crucifixion and the ascension at the same time because you had the cross that was, you know, they always say, the more recent thing is I'm, we're going to put this behind us. And so that might, if that term was in vogue, that would have illustrated that as well, that the cross was behind him and that was no longer part of his 
his uh, uh, narrative, and he was going, you know, ascending into the sky zone if you're lucky. And uh, there was one, so that had a kind of serious component to it, but the one aspect that I thought uh, that might have presented a kind of humor, humorous quality, but also represented a kind of that reality base, that they used to have uh, on the corners, people would sell these uh, blow up balloons that had a little Mickey Mouse or some sort of character in the shape of uh, a mouse. And then they would have this little cardboard shoe thing that they would pull the tied up uh, bl balloon in and then put it through the, this little hole component that was in the shoe. And so I put that, uh, I think I did a representation of that, right. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for nodding in agreement. And uh, <laughs> Barbara owns that uh, piece. But, uh, and so that represented, you know, the kind of nails through the feet there component. So how? And he has his time, too. And that is what? Um, <laughs> it's, it's about the Savior and uh -huh. Was it? No, I think it was just Christ Kite. Choose, oh yeah, choose, choose. choose Yeah, that's right. Choose save your fur. Right. <laughs> okay. Choose what? Oh, yeah. Oh. Right. Okay. So I, I want to maybe that's a good way to talk to get to talk a little bit about language in yeah. your work and and in <clears throat> curious um, puns, visual puns, and especially um, linguistic puns mm -hmm. play a, an important yeah. part. Are they? Do, do, Generally, does it does the pun come first, and then the uh, then the painting come later, or does it go? The it's other more uh, occasionally. I might have some thoughts about that initially uh, in setting up a piece, but a lot of times it is like with the shoe thing. You know, it, it just comes afterwards. Of you know, I continually have the kind of free associative kind of style, and so uh, it's just like uh, uh, you know, uh, working on a piece, and I kind of think of this. And I do a lot of sketches, so that usually would occur in a sketch format, you know. And so when I'm doing a number of different sketches and drawings, uh, that's when that my mind is kind of activating toward different. I do a number of different uh, uh, setups that you know I'm working on maybe the Christ guy, et cetera, and then something else uh, at the same time. So I've got a number of ideas activating, and so going back and forth, I have time to think about it and. Uh, Free associate to the, the thoughts around that particular image. I think uh, blues and, and rhythm and blues music is really um, important to you, and, and kind of double entendre and yeah, things right, like right. that. And, yeah. and punning comes into that music right. yeah, a, a lot. Is right. that that's yeah. seems like that's yeah related. yeah. I mean, I get uh, yeah. The it's more of the sexual double entendre would be referencing that. But uh, yeah, I really like that aspect of the musical. I. Yeah, the use of words there to kind of uh, allude, you know, make it a little bit more poetic or dramatic in presentation in the blues. I think in a way you did answer the question about uh, the idea of a, you know, type of, of humor. Type of humor, yeah. because by suggesting that everybody had their own particular way of doing mm -hmm. things, and mm -hmm. that the, that. Um, I mean that's already an answer, and that but that you think that most of most everybody went into it not with the idea of making a funny painting, but right. instead with that being a byproduct of making mm -hmm. the work. Right. I was thinking a little bit about the um, that one thing that differentiates the kind of humor that we're talking about in all of this work from a lot of other kinds of let's say more direct joke style humor. Mm -hmm is a quality of indirectness, mm -hmm. of obliqueness, mm -hmm. of ambiguity, and mm -hmm. that kind of lack of a punchline. You said yeah. yours sometimes do have a yeah, punchline. Right. But even when they have a punchline, like ar armpits is a yeah. great example, yeah. mm -hmm. that I if you stop at the punchline with that one, you mm -hmm. miss 90% of the painting. Mm -hmm. Because what's going on in it, it's almost like that's there as a false, uh, as, a, as a decoy, as a yeah, red right, herring, right. to good. take you away from yeah. things that are right. actually in it. Mm -hmm. um, I well, guess I'm not asking you a question. You're, 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 well, you're, you're presenting a good uh, uh, synopsis of what, what I can't quite express. So that sounds good. <laughs> that's, that's what we call bad interviewing right there. Um, 
Well, what I, maybe we can move even to more general issues for a minute, and sure. then I want to ask you to do one final thing for okay, us. Sure. More general issues I want to ask about just have to do with things that have actually come up earlier in the day a little bit here mm -hmm. and there, but things since you're a working artist, yeah. since you're one of these working artists we can ask you specifically about, um, sort of how uh, you can use humor and maintain seriousness. And that mm -hmm. is kind of what is that balance for you? Um, and especially, do, do you ever feel that the humor runs a risk of trivializing the work or of pulling it into, uh, making it, pulling it into being seen in a way that you might not want it to be seen? Uh, no, I don't give that a thought. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'll, I'm seeing one of the things, one of the pieces in the catalog or whatever it, it might label it, uh, where I have uh, two individuals that are cut out and uh, there is a, a projectile coming off out of the backs. And that had to do with, that was a premise that was more uh, maybe graveyard humor in a way, where uh, the idea is that these two are fish, ice fishing and they're using an, they have used an ice pick to cut open the hole so that they can put themselves down into and uh, there was when the salmon run uh, you have people that can that uh, uh, hang out at these uh, when they go upstream and you have people trying to catch the salmon but with their bare hands so this would be s similar in a, in a more wintry situation there so you have them cutting through the ice with the ice pick and then putting the ice pick in their back and then having their companion lower them down uh, <laughs> into the water. So, that's a, so that was kind of a premise of that particular piece. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, but the, the form is important, you know, the color palette and, the, you know, the structure and, you know, the, the dimensionality of the handle of the ice uh, and then the flatness of the cutout form there, and uh, this is an articulated figures that kind of wave back and forth the the, the legs and the arms. Uh, so it has these formal things I'm thinking about as well. So I think I know the answer to yeah. this last yeah, sure. uh, specific question, but you know, following up on that, is there a line across which something? Is would be too jokey or too silly to function as art yeah. as you see it. Right. Uh, uh, again, I don't. You know, uh, that doesn't. At least in my own work, I don't think about that. It's, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't think so. Yeah. I mean, right. Good. Okay. <laughs> We're lucky. Okay. Um, last thing I'd sure. like is maybe if you would. Uh, you've been so generous in talking through all of these images, yeah. but I'd ask you to talk through one more image sure. with us, which is. A very well-known image. Yeah, and it's the Screaming Jay Hawkins image. Okay, we have it up here. Okay, and I, I was thinking about it. And the funny thing to me is when I asked you initially whether you would do this with us, you said, yeah. "Oh, it's not really a very funny." Yeah, painting. right. And you pointed out that the armpit rubber was. That seems funny yeah. to me. Right, right. Armpit rubber yeah. down at the bottom seems right. funny. And then yeah. maybe, uh, maybe it's also it brings up what is funny, right? Mm -hmm. Which is something we're sort of taking for granted here. Yeah, but it does change from person to person. I think it's a very funny painting yeah. myself, uh -huh. but, um, but that's yeah. me. Sure, well that's good. I, that's what I like. That the, uh, I, the main premise for my paintings is that I don't want to be directive, you know, and that if it, if it reads too clearly that there's only one way of looking at one of my pieces, then I'm a little bit, uh, you know, that would be the, not so much if it goes beyond the level of being too humorous. But if it becomes too obvious and there's only one way of reading it, then uh, that doesn't, I don't like that at all. So I, you know, I really welcome more different options to the, to whatever painting I would put out there. Uh, and the armpit rubber, I just kind of thought of that and seeing, talking, you know, the Aronson collection there in terms of the armpit. Uh, that it was some somehow a kind of weird uh, connection back to that piece in some respects, but it had to do with also sweat, and in terms of uh, as alluded to earlier, that this is a, a homage to J Screaming Jay Hawkins, and s you were talking in the intro 
about a frog, you know, you open up the frog and tr dissect it. And it's a little bit like that's, that was the original premise that I would kind of open up, you know, the idea of this kind of, uh, he would, his presentation was so uh, dynamic and exposing, you know, the interior of himself, you know, the, this kind of really strong kind of presentation of, of song and uh, grunts and groans, etc. cetera, that uh, I kind of split his body open in effect. And it was more like that seeing the interior and exterior as well. And in all this kind of gyrations, et cetera, of the performer, uh, there's frequently a lot of, you know, sweat is pouring out, uh, like screaming Jay Hawkins or anybody like James Brown, et cetera, that really uh, work out in a performance. And uh, so I wanted to set up something, provide some sort of uh, component that would address the flying sweat situation for people in the first rows. And so I proposed <laughs> this kind of outfit that people could purchase at the door. A rent, I should say. <laughs> So, that's that's right. that's amazing. Yeah, that's more than we bargained for. Okay. <laughs> right. My, I, I, so I, I should, I'll probably end it at that. There's a lot of other associations there, but they're not in there. That's fantastic. Realm of humor. I, I I'll just take the uh, I, I tell a really teeny quick anecdote. My my sure. mom and dad went to school at Oak Park. Oh, sorry. My Do my it. my parents. Now yeah. I'm going to tell a story about my parents. Okay. <laughs> my, my parents went to school at Oak Park River Forest High School and uh, in the um, mid-50s. And my mom one day, casually, after I'd been writing about music for a long time and interested in R&B and all sorts of stuff, says, oh yeah, your dad and I saw uh, Screamin' Jay Hawkins. Mm -hmm. And I said, when? 1955, 56. Yeah. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And apparently some enterprising weirdo at the, um, their high school brought Screaming Jay Hawkins to perform for a noontime function. <laughs> oh, great. The entire oh, wow. school went yeah. to see this, yeah. and Screaming Jay Hawkins came in <laughs> mm -hmm. to the auditorium with mm -hmm. a, um, uh, my mom said it was the first time I ever saw fluorescent. Uh -huh. A fluorescent green turban and a fluorescent green <laughs> cape. Yeah. And she said he performed in the middle of the auditorium, but yeah. his cape never came all the way in the door. It all went <laughs> all the way out. Oh, God. And he sat yeah. down and played yeah. solo yeah. Yeah. by himself. Yeah. And they all were like, what just landed? <laughs> and he played uh, yeah. uh, all of his yeah. great wow. songs and then left. And they, they were oh, never the wow. same. That's terrific. Wow. So, yeah. Um, it's great to know. Yeah. If they'd only had this outfit, yeah. I think right. they would have been prepared yeah. for, uh, right. for Screaming right. Jay. Wow. Okay. Well, wow. that's great. Okay. Uh, Carl, thank that's you great. for, uh, for okay. uh, illuminating us. Okay, sure. Thank you.